the Mangaboos proved dangerous. When the wizard awoke, the six colored suns were shining down upon the land of the Mangaboos just as they had done ever since his arrival. The little man, having had a good sleep, felt rested and refreshed, and looking through the glass partition of the room, he saw Zeb sitting up on his bench and yawning, so the wizard went in to him. Zeb, said he, my balloon is of no further use in this strange country, so I may as well leave it on the square where it fell, but in the basket car are some things I would like to keep with me. I wish you would go and fetch my satchel, two lanterns, and a can of kerosene oil that is under the seat. There is nothing else that I care about. So the boy went willingly upon the errand, and by the time he had returned Dorothy was awake. Then the three held a council to decide what they should do next, but could think of no way to better their condition. "'I don't like these vegetable people,' said the little girl. "'They're cold and flabby, like cabbages, in spite of their prettiness.' "'I agree with you. It is because there is no warm blood in them,' remarked the wizard. "'And they have no hearts, so they can't love anyone, not even themselves,' declared the boy." The princess is lovely to look at, continued Dorothy thoughtfully, but I don't care much for her after all. If there was any other place to go, I'd like to go there. But is there any other place? asked the wizard. I don't know, she answered. Just then they heard the big voice of Jim the cab horse calling to them, and going to the doorway leading to the dome, they found the princess and a throng of her people had entered the house of the sorcerer. So they went down to greet the beautiful vegetable lady, who said to them, I have been talking with my advisers about you meat people, and we have decided that you do not belong in the land of Mangaboos and must not remain here. How can we go away? asked Dorothy. Oh, you cannot go away, of course, so you must be destroyed, was the answer. In what way? inquired the wizard. We shall throw you three people into the garden of the twining vines, said the princess, and they will soon crush you and devour your bodies to make themselves grow bigger. The animals you have with you we will drive to the mountains and put into the black pit. Then our country will be rid of all its unwelcome visitors. But you are in need of a sorcerer, said the wizard, and not one of those growing is yet ripe enough to pick. I am greater than any thorn-covered sorcerer that ever grew in your garden. Why destroy me? It is true we need a sorcerer, acknowledged the princess, but I am informed that one of our own will be ready to pick in a few days to take the place of Gwig, whom you cut in two before it was time for him to be planted. Let us see your arts and the sorceries you are able to perform. Then I will decide whether to destroy you with the others or not. At this the wizard made a bow to the people and repeated his trick of producing the nine tiny piglets and making them disappear again. He did it very cleverly indeed, and the princess looked at the strange piglets as if she were as truly astonished as any vegetable person could be. But afterward she said, I have heard of this wonderful magic, but it accomplishes nothing of value. What else can you do? The wizard tried to think. Then he jointed together the blades of his sword, and balanced it very skillfully upon the end of his nose, but even that did not satisfy the princess. Just then his eye fell upon the lanterns and the can of kerosene oil which Zeb had brought from the car of his balloon, and he got a clever idea from those commonplace things. "'Your Highness,' said he, I will now proceed to prove my magic by creating two suns that you have never seen before. Also I will exhibit a destroyer much more dreadful than your clinging vines. So he placed Dorothy upon one side of him and the boy upon the other, and set a lantern upon each of their heads. Don't laugh, he whispered to them, or you will spoil the effect of my magic. 
Then, with much dignity and a look of vast importance upon his wrinkled face, the wizard got out his matchbook and lighted the two lanterns. The glare they made was very small when compared to the radiance of the six great colored suns, but still they gleamed steadily and clearly. The Mangaboos were much impressed, because they had never before seen any light that did not come directly from their suns. Next the wizard poured a pool of oil from the can upon the glass floor, where it covered quite a broad surface. When he lighted the oil, a hundred tongues of flame shot up, and the effect was really imposing. "'Now, Princess,' exclaimed the wizard, "'those of your advisers who wished to throw me into the Garden of Clinging Vines must step within this circle of light. If they advised you well and were in the right, they will not be injured in any way. But if any advised you wrongly, the light will wither him.' The advisers of the princess did not like this test, but she commanded them to step into the flame, and one by one they did so, and were scorched so badly that the air was soon filled with an odor like that of baked potatoes. Some of the mangaboos fell down and had to be dragged from the fire, and all were so withered that it would be necessary to plant them at once. "'Sir,' said the princess to the wizard, you are greater than any sorcerer we have ever known, as it is evident that my people have advised me wrongly. I will not cast you three people into the dreadful garden of the clinging vines, but your animals must be driven into the black pit in the mountain, for my subjects cannot bear to have them around. The wizard was so pleased to have saved the two children and himself that he said nothing against this decree. But when the princess had gone, both Jim and Eureka protested they did not want to go to the black pit, and Dorothy promised she would do all that she could to save them from such a fate. For two or three days after this, if we call days the periods between sleep, there being no night to divide the hours into days, our friends were not disturbed in any way. They were even permitted to occupy the house of the sorcerer in peace, as if it had been their own, and to wander in the gardens in search of food. Once they came near to the enclosed garden of the clinging vines, and walking high into the air, looked down upon it with much interest. They saw a mass of tough green vines, all matted together and writhing and twisting around like a nest of great snakes. Everything the vines touched, they crushed, and our adventurers were indeed thankful to have escaped being cast among them. Whenever the wizard went to sleep, he would take the nine tiny piglets from his pocket and let them run around on the floor of his room to amuse themselves and get some exercise, and one time they found his glass door ajar and wandered into the hall and then into the bottom part of the great dome walking through the air as easily as Eureka could. They knew the kitten by this time, so they scampered over to where she lay beside Jim, and commenced to frisk and play with her. The cab-horse, who never slept long at a time, sat upon his haunches and watched the tiny piglets and the kitten with much approval. "'Don't be rough,' he would call out, if Eureka knocked over one of the round, fat piglets with her paw. But the pigs never minded and enjoyed the sport very greatly. Suddenly they looked up to find the room filled with the silent, solemn-eyed mangaboos. Each of the vegetable folk bore a branch covered with sharp thorns, which was thrust defiantly toward the horse, the kitten, and the piglets. "'Here, stop this foolishness!' Jim roared angrily. But after being pricked once or twice, he got upon his four legs and kept out of the way of the thorns. The mangaboos surrounded them in solid ranks, but left an opening to the doorway of the hall, so the animals slowly retreated until they were driven from the room and out upon the street. Here were more of the vegetable people with thorns, and silently they urged the now frightened creatures down the street. 
Jim had to be careful not to step upon the tiny piglets, who scampered under his feet, grunting and squealing, while Eureka, snarling and biting at the thorns pushed toward her, also tried to protect the pretty little things from injury. Slowly but steadily the heartless Mangaboos drove them on, until they had passed through the city and the gardens, and come to the broad plains leading to the mountain. "'What does all this mean, anyhow?' asked the horse, jumping to escape a thorn. "'Why, they're driving us toward the black pit, into which they threatened to cast us,' replied the kitten. "'If I were as big as you are, Jim, I'd fight these miserable turnip roots.' "'What would you do?' inquired Jim. "'I'd kick out with those long legs and iron-shod hoofs.' "'All right,' said the horse. "'I'll do it.' An instant later he suddenly backed toward the crowd of mangaboos and kicked out his hind legs as hard as he could. A dozen of them smashed together and tumbled to the ground, and seeing his success, Jim kicked again and again, charging into the vegetable crowd, knocking them in all directions, and sending the others scattering to escape his iron heels. Eureka helped him by flying into the faces of the enemy and scratching and biting furiously, and the kitten ruined so many vegetable complexions that the mangaboos feared her as much as they did the horse. But the foes were too many to be repulsed for long. They tired Jim and Eureka out, and although the field of battle was thickly covered with mashed and disabled mangaboos, our animal friends had to give up at last and allow themselves to be driven to the mountain. End of chapter 6